Boom. All right. So very special guests on the Calavi podcast. This is actually a first for me. Um, Ashley, you're paving the way. Uh, first professional softball player on the podcast. So, oh, really? Yeah. Happy to be here. <laughs> I'm excited <laughs> to have you. <laughs> so mm-hmm. um, I did some research on you and girl, you were a thief on the bases. <laughs> oh my god. I goodness. love base running. I love it so much. Yeah. I love it. Well, everyone, we're going to go ahead and jump into um, just kind of picking the goods and the ins and the outs and the bads with Ashley. And you guys can call her coach too, because I know she coaches a lot of you with Ashley B training. She is the founder of that company, five years strong, correct? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I love it. So um, let's get into it. You ready? I'm ready. Born okay. ready. Let's go. <laughs> All right. So with that first question about you being, well, first statement about being a thief, I was sitting there thinking last night, my husband and I were talking about it and he's a baseball coach. And I was like, yeah, I'm looking forward to um, interviewing Ash today. And I was just looking at her stats, just, just kind of stayed in that high school realm, not even getting to your collegiate stats yet. And I was like, she was a thief. So my question was for you, what made you decide to put your emphasis into hitting versus base running, let alone infield? Cause you not only held down first base, but you also held down second base. So mm-hmm. why all the cookies in one basket for hitting? Um, I mean, I will say hitting has always been the thing where like, I feel like I have the most control. Mm-hmm. Um, it's, it's been my favorite thing simply because I have the bat in my hand. And once I was taught, you know, how to be that aggressive hitter to make other people scared of me. Um, I think that's kind of what started it, especially cause I actually was right-handed, um, until the age of 11 or 12 and I switched over to the left side and that's mm-hmm. the first time I started hitting from the left side. So I naturally throw right-handed hit left-handed. Um, well, I can't say naturally cause it took a whole winter of training to get good at left side, but I knew I was quick and I wanted to test that part of my game. And I love the left side. Um, and I learned quickly that slapping was the, the, the piece of the puzzle that your job is to make the infield and the outfield scared of you. Um, because they don't know what you're going to bring, whether it's a bunt, a slap, a hard slap, a hard hit to the outfield, like to be that triple threat was something that I started owning at a young age. So I knew that my job was to make the defense scared of me. So I kind of brought that with me to base running. I was like, okay, well, once I get to first, now my job is to make sure the defense is focused on me and not the hitter. And now the pitcher's nervous. And now she's going to throw meatballs to my next hitter and she can <laughs> score me. So um, I feel like that's kind of where that whole like just offensive, like game mode mindset on the bases kind of started for me. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I guess just defensively, it's my job is to back up my pitcher and to make any play that I possibly can to make her successful. So I think when I started, you know, a lot of my closest friends were pitchers. And as soon as I kind of jumped into the realm of like, no, she's going to throw great pitches. And, and, you know, every once in a while when she slips, I'm going to make sure I make the play for her. So um, that was kind of my approach to the game. I love that. I highly recommend that if you are an athlete or a coach and you're listening to this, I need you to go back and listen to that again. So much value because you corrected yourself on the switch. It took you a whole winter season. Like young ladies need to know this. They're not just going to wake up and be able to hit on the other side. Oh yeah. I sucked. I was so bad at first, (laughs) but like, that's the thing is like, I had coaches that they told me they're like, Ashley, it's going to look ugly. Like that's Mm -hmm. just what it's going to look like at the beginning. But if it's something that you want to do, just keep working at it. And of course, like, um, you know, I still had to manage hitting from the right side because I wasn't just going to be able to flip and play in my winter games in the indoor tournaments and be able to be successful. So I still actually spent a whole year switch hitting just Mm -hmm. to get comfortable. Um, but you know, once my dad coached me at that time too. So when he was starting to say, okay, trust it, stay on the left side the whole time. Um, I even, uh, interviewed Natasha Watley on my podcast and she was telling me how, um, how she teaches her slappers is, Um, when you start playing in games, your goal should be to never, you know, get two strikes and move back to the right side. You should Mm -hmm. be able to learn how to fight on the left side. So, 
Um, my dad actually taught me that at a young age. He's like, when you decide if you're going to be on the right side or the left side, I need you to stick to that for an entire at bat. And then we can make changes depending on the situation if needed. If we have, you know, runners in scoring position and you feel better on the right side at that time, do it. So I spent a whole summer flopping from right to left. Um, but this is another aspect that made me really want to stay on the left side was um, I'm right. I dominant. So mm. when I flipped to the left side, I noticed that I could see the ball better. And I know I'm not crazy because I've actually talked to other people who have switched and they said the same exact thing. They can see the ball better from the left side. Um, so after that one crazy season of right and left, I said, dad, I just want to be left. Um, and yes, it was so rough at first. Like I pretty sure I struck out like the first like 10 attempts, but that's just part of it. Yeah. Um, especially from like learning not only a new side of the plate, but being able to see the ball and figuring out what strikes are, it's just different. So mm -hmm. of course it took a lot of time, but I never gave up thankfully. Well, that's good. I mean, one thing that I feel like you and I, as instructors, as coaches, as former players, we both talk a lot about trust and there's a phrase that's trending, but I have a feeling that you've probably said it for years. I know I've said it for years, but in order to get confident, you have to practice. And in mm -hmm. that practice, the confidence that you're building allows you to trust your training. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to kind of pick your brain on that. As far as, as a hitting coach, as somebody who does a lot of mental training with her hitters, like, do you, um, unpack that in like a four-step model, three-step model, or do you have them identify one thing that is their trigger to pull in to trusting their training? I definitely don't have a cookie cutter approach to this. I think every athlete kind of learns differently. And I know you probably feel the same way. Um, you know, some athletes that, you know, are really struggling with confidence. Um, we start with the basics. Like we start with, you know, your job at the plate is to make good contact. That's it. Let's find good contact. That's all. Um, and then we strive to make that happen. And once they start to, you know, feel more confident, especially just off a of front toss, like we don't even go to live pitching yet. We're just trying to get confident hit balls where we want to and, and make good contact off a of front toss. Then we start kind of moving up to a level of like, okay, well, let me throw live to you now, or let me, you know, let's have a pitcher throw to you and let's try to still keep that same exact mindset of like, I'm just looking for good contact here. And when we kind of take that approach of just like one thing, we're just focusing on good contact, then they're looking for what they want. Therefore they find themselves, you know, not overthinking as much. It's just like, Oh no, just, I'm just looking for good contact. And, <clears throat> excuse me. And when they go for a bad pitch and they make bad contact, they can, I'll, I'll then ask the question of like, okay, so how do we get here? Oh, well, I went for the low and out pitch and it was definitely not a pitch that I could find good barrel on. And then they be able to answer, answer their own questions and they can then take that into games with them. So my approach as a coach in that situation is, yes, we have to develop trust. But when you have an athlete who like doesn't even know where to start, let's just find good contact and know what that feels like and work Keep for it. it. Simple. I love it. Keep it simple. That's great. I know with me, with pitching, it's kind of the same approach. Like, okay, that pitch didn't work. And where is the strong pitch? Like what I always teach them, you know, their foundational pitch. Do you mm -hmm. have that approach as a hitting coach? Like, all right, so you attempted that. Let's go for the pitch that you know you can hit. Yeah, I think so. This is the hard part because I think growing up, I was always taught, well, only go for the first pitch if it's your pitch. Well, mm -hmm. I've, I've started, well, I don't like it. So, but, but I, I'm like, I'm like this conversation. I like where it's headed. I was going to say, because <laughs> I've learned enough through pitchers that your job and what you're trying to do is get ahead on me. So why on earth would I let, you know, let's, let's divide. I like to divide the hitting zone into like nine quadrants so or nine quadrants quadrants is not the word I was thinking oh. of, but nine, <laughs> nine spots. Yeah. Why would I say that I only want one of the nine? What are the odds I'm going to get that pitch? It's like virtually nothing. Mm -hmm. Right. So if we can actually expand that more into a quadrant and say, okay, if I get something along, you know, the lines of three of the four, that I feel comfortable hitting. Like you can have one spot where you don't like it. Like mm -hmm. for me, when I got to college, I hated the low and out. So there was no way I was going for a low and out pitch unless I had two strikes, but I had to be aggressive on the other three, especially early on, 
because you as a pitcher are trying to get ahead on me. So why would I limit myself to only choosing one of the nine spots when I should be aggressive? I'm the one, I'm the one with the bat in my hand. So my job is to make sure that, you know, I have at least three of the four quadrants. If we divide it up into four of the zone that I feel comfortable hitting and go get it and have the mindset of if it's close to those spots, I'm crushing it. Now, of course, it's so much easier to say than actually do, but I think that mindset, it starts in practice. You get your reps on that type of aggressive mindset in practice. Mm -hmm. You can't just expect yourself to walk into games and be like, okay, I'm going to go for three of the four. No, you have to know exactly what it is you want and exactly what it is you don't want. And um, I think that just helps hitters be able to stand in the box and feel ready to go and trust themselves then. Yeah, no, I I like that because- Right now, I feel like at that 12U age, that's the team that I volunteer coach with. It's so funny to watch them. They'll go through these peaks and valleys. And right now I have a handful of batters that if the ball is just this much lower than what they like, they'll leave it and the umpire will call it a strike. Mm -hmm. And we're just myself and the rest of the coaching staff, we're all like anything close. Like you want to hit that miss. Like, and it's just funny to watch their wheels turn. So I'm excited for the girls to hear this value. Like this is huge for them. So yeah, I will, I will say my hitting coach definitely helped me out a ton. Um, this was a coach that had coached in college for a long period of time. So what she's telling me, she's telling her college hitters. So I feel like it's worth sharing. So we would do every single time I would hit, um, with her, I would have 45 swings before we even start the lesson. Um, so we'd get there early to get our cuts in before we started. Um, but when we took those 45 swings back to those nine quadrant, nine quadrants, nine zones, <laughs> um, I don't know why I keep saying quadrants. It just sounds right, but we'd go to those nine zones. So we'd go three high pitches in middle out three middle pitches in middle out. And then same thing with low. And we hit five balls in each of those zones. But whenever we did the high pitch, we went just above the strike zone. Mm -hmm. like something that's flirting with the strike zone. When we went to outside pitches, we did something just flirting with the outside part of the plate. Something that if a umpire sees it and likes it and calls it, we can still feel comfortable there. Cause if, if we can hit that pitch, then the actual pitch, that's obviously a strike is so much easier to hit. So from day one, every single time that I'm hitting off the tee, I'm working on pitches just outside of the zone in every spot. Same thing with inside pitch as uncomfortable as that is working on something that's just inside that is getting you uncomfortable um, and trying to figure out how to barrel up that pitch off the tee. It made me so much more confident as a hitter. And I was hitting balls over the fence that weren't even strikes at that point, because I just was comfortable hitting balls that, you know, if I wanted it, I knew how to get there and I've trained myself to know how to get there. So that's like some of the best advice that I was ever given from a hitting coach. And now you know, all of my kids are doing that. Like when they go home, I'm like, did you do your 45 swings? And they're like, well, I can only do three of the five. I'm like, that's better than nothing. So even if you don't have time for, I would say 45 swings, um, five balls in each of those zones probably takes about 15 minutes. Um, and I tell girls, like, if that's the only thing you do that day, that's good. You're working on your muscle memory. You're, you're developing that. So, um, that is, that is some of the stuff that I think truly led to me being, a great hitter later on was, you know, lear- learning that around the age of, I think, I think it was like 13, no, nah, maybe 14 or 15. Um, but if I would have adopted that earlier, who knows what, it, what would have happened? Well, and when did you hit your growth spurt? Cause I was listening to one of your episodes and you were saying that I think you were only like five, one year freshman year. Yeah. When did you hit your spurt? Yeah, I was five, one going into my freshman year of high school. Um, and then it was my junior year between my junior and senior year. I, I grew like four inches in a summer. So it was crazy. Yeah. I love that. And I think that definitely needs to be discussed more, like not just in the pitching realm, but in the like overall athletic realm for female athletes, because I have so many girls that will, you know, they're five, two, and they're comparing their height to like a 17 year old girl along with their speed and their ability, like comparing the, the beginning to the middle, to the end kind of scenario. And I always tell them, I'm like, just be patient. It's going to happen around 16, 17 years of age. You are going to finally feel 
like confident. Like there's something like little things are going to start clicking. But with that, that doesn't mean that you choose the easy road. That means you do like the compound effect, right? Like Darren Hardy, you do all those things correct over and over again, even at your most awkward moment. Right. Mm -hmm. And then it just lines you up for that perfect timing. Yeah. And I think it's I'm about just making the most of what you got because I was hitting home runs before I was even in high school and I was super tiny and super skinny. If you can think of the tiniest little player, little nugget with, you know, no muscle mass yet, really still being able to hit balls over the fence. I knew, and I had people around me that just encouraged me to just use what I got. I right. That. I played basketball. I was the scrappy little girl. That's like running around the court and, and stealing the ball from those post players that were slower than me. Like, I just knew from a young age that if you utilize what you have, and even though I was scrawny and hitting balls over the fence, I knew how to use my body in a way to where this ball can go far. So no matter if you're small, and this is where I really, I don't know if many parents listen, but, um, I really emphasize, you know, when, when an athlete comes up to me and says, I want to go hit a ball over the fence and the parents on the side going, well, she's never going to do that. She's too small that's what gets me going. Like that's what grinds my gears because if you know that this is something that you want to do, yes, we may have to adjust how we approach our hitting. We may have to adjust how we use our legs more, right? But mm -hmm. you can use what you got. And like Amanda Scarborough, perfect example <laughs> of a pitcher who yep. is, you know, she was an all-American from AM and she was tiny. Like yep. what was she like five three? She, I like, think she was five four. Yeah. Five, four. And she's got every pitch in the book, mm -hmm. but also can like locate every single one of her pitches. So dominant mm -hmm. through fast. Like who cares? Like she's throwing just under the speed of like Monica Abbott and Monica Abbott's like a foot taller than her. So yeah. I think it's just a matter of a mindset. Um, I also had Amanda on my podcast and we kind of talked about that, how like, you know, a lot of people could easily tell Amanda like, well, you're just not going to throw that hard, but here's the deal what insecure person is going to tell a child that they can't go throw as hard as they want to like, but, but also like, even if you maybe can't get to that speed based on your size, there's other elements of pitching that can make you great. Right. Same thing with hitting. Mm -hmm. So I think that's just like the wild and crazy thing is like, we don't need stereotypes in this game. If you want something, there's a way to get there. Right. hundred percent. I agree with that. And I, you just pulled that out of my head. I was like, Amanda, like, and I use her to a lot of example because she did compete at that higher level as a shorter pitcher. Um, me, like you heard my story, but I did top out my junior year throwing 63 miles per hour. And I was like, whoa. So now the way it's changed so much, like, and I don't know, you're 30, I'm fixing to be 43. So we have quite the gap, I think, in the things that were told, like, um, as far as like educational pieces that were available for coaches, does that make mm -hmm. sense? Sure, um, sure. I know mine, a lot of mine came from men, fast pitch coaches and men, fast pitch players. I got a lot of coaching from that. Like the way I throw, um, an outside fastball and a curveball are kind of like weird to people, but once they do it and they experience it, they're like, Whoa. And the catcher's like, wait a minute, she stepped over here, but the ball came over here, you know? So um, with that, do you feel like if, okay, so let's just take, um, we'll just use my daughter. So the way you were explaining yourself, uh, made me think of my kid. She's a seventh grader. She's probably an inch below me and I've already lost an inch. I used to be five, three, now I'm five, two. So she's about five, one. Um, she's starting to get muscular and I noticed, and this is something I've learned in just 24 years of coaching, like it goes like this, right? Like they'll be on mm -hmm. and then all of a sudden you'll notice, wait, something's not right. And they hit that growth spurt. So as a hitting instructor, when you have that moment with your hitter and you can see it in their body language, you're like, something's off. Like, what is your first identifier? Like, do you pick up on the fact that their sleeves are a little bit shorter or their pants are a little bit shorter. Like what is it like a gut feeling or have you just gotten to that place where you just know it's coming? Um, 
I mean, I work with a lot of youth players. I work with a lot of high school players and yeah, there's always that time where like they're growing into themselves, but Mm -hmm. I try to make it very clear at the beginning. Like when I know I'm working with somebody young, like, Hey, your swing right now is not going to look the same in five years, but let's make the most of what your, what your body can do now. And let's learn those fundamentals now. So as you do grow into yourself, you're just picking up on, you know, the same things that you've always been doing, just the way and the route of how you get to the ball might be just a little bit different because you have longer arms. Um, And this is the part where I will say I have found hitters. They get so defeated because they're what was working before isn't working now. But as soon as I, you know, break the barrier of like, Hey, you realize you're like, you know, four inches taller. Now your body's different. Um, then they start thinking to themselves, Oh yeah. Like shoot. That's like, I I was still living in the past trying to think of, you know, the way that I was doing things before I'm still trying to do, and it's just not going to work. So as soon as you let go of that mindset, and I will say, you know, for some, it takes a longer time than others to kind of adjust to that. But the ones who say, okay, I am a little bit taller. I can get a little bit wider because I, I need to, I need to use the ground more. Um, once they start adopting, you know, the things that maybe we were talking about at a young age, but now are more relevant now, um, they, the ones who just adopt it and they say, okay, it's going to suck at first, but let's just keep going. Like they're the ones who make the the fastest progress. So they embrace the suck. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No, it's a, it's a temporary place. Yeah. I like yeah. that. And that's this kind of the same thing that I do with my pitchers. I'm like, Hey, your, your speed's going to come in. And then all of a sudden you're not going to be able to hit anything. And then one day it's going to work all together and, you know, just be ready because until that junior year, you know, you're, it's just weird. It's very Mm -hmm. weird how we grow. Right. But to me, it's like growth through anything. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, I don't know about you, but that's, that's one of the reasons why I love softball. I know my husband loves baseball for that reason is both of these sports teach a lot about management of life. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And this is why I say, I'm just going to probably give lessons until the day I die, because I'm always learning too, like from my kids and, you know, back to that whole like adjustment period of, you know, getting bigger, stronger, whatever Mm -hmm. we have to understand that, you know, our strengths are going to change they're not always going to be the same strengths. Like when I got super long and lengthy, I started to like the outside pitch a little bit more because it was so much easier to get to. And I love, and when I say I'm tall and lengthy, I'm just under six foot, super long limbs. I love the low pitch. And I, as a kid used to hate the low pitch. And so it's so interesting how I can use these levers differently, but you know, you don't, whatever your strength is this year, it might be different next year. And that's okay. If anything, it's better because now the scouting report is like, we thought you didn't like this and now you do. So it's good to like, keep adjusting. And you and I were talking about Kobe the other day on Instagram and I love his approach to just how he trained was his off season was always choosing something that, you know, was a flaw in the previous season. And he was going to do whatever it took to become great at that thing within the, however many months off season was, and that was going to be his main focus. And I don't think he ever said he had the same thing two years in a row. So if we take that approach to our training and we say, Hey, you know, I and you just own the fact that I did not do great at let's think basketball terms at free throws this year. I'm going to spend so much time on free throws and make it a pressure situation. Cause that's what they are. Mm-hmm. If you know exactly what the flaw is, you know, exactly what you can be working on. So again, your strengths are going to change everyone. Like, and, and that is just normal. That is part of the process. Yeah. It's, it's funny because for me, the metaphor that's been coming up a lot in a lot of my coach training is, you know, we always talk about peeling back the onion and getting to somebody's personality and really getting to know them. but as a coach, it's more of peeling back the onion and really identifying where the flaw is like the one thing. And it could just be the thought process, Mm -hmm. the mental game. Like you are a firm believer in visualization. I love that about you because my mom was my first coach. My mom and my real dad coached me, but my mom kind of carried the torch more. So, and I think just as a female, I just leaned into her more because my mom was seven months pregnant with my sister sliding into home, you know, plate when she was playing for the church league back in the day, you know, she would, she caught and she would take bats to the catcher's mask. Like my mom was crazy. She's, I just love my mom. 
But um, you, you talk about grandma, how you want to make sure like, what would grandma think? And mine is always, what would my mom think? What would my mom think? So, mm-hmm. so I get you on that. But with that, I got off topic here. I got so excited. Oh, visualization. Sorry. <laughs> like I was talking about one of my favorite people. So, but uh, mm-hmm. visualization was something that my mom literally started with my sister and I both when we were little, it was always, you know, you've got to see yourself throwing the stripe. You've got to see yourself. My sister caught and played third base or short. She was always in the hot corner. Um, if not behind the plate and she would say, you've got to see yourself throwing that runner out. And it was just weird then because not everybody was on board with it. So like when I would talk about like visualization, like, ah, you know, what are you doing, Callie? I'm just, I'm watching myself strike people out. And, you know, my teammates in high school, the latter years were just like, what? And I'm just like, I don't know. It's what my mom taught me, but she would always Mm -hmm. tell me, like, I'll never forget the one college game that she was able to make it to. Um, She's behind the catcher's plate and she's like, see it a little bit. That's what she would tell me. See it a little bit. And once I would hear that, it would just like, (laughs) like just lock in. And it's so weird how those, those phrases can just bring you in. So I wanted to Mm -hmm. ask you since, you know, that is common strand between you and I with the family and stuff like that. And parents coaching us, was there something that your dad could say maybe one word or one phrase that would just lock you in? Like if you ever felt like you were kind of out in that desperation place and all of a sudden you'd hear your dad's voice and you were just like, boom. Yeah. I I don't know if I can think of just one, cause there's always, you know, when you work with your dad for so long, like there's so many different things that kind of trigger you, mm. um, trigger you in a good way, <laughs> I should yeah, say. Yeah, yeah. Um, but you know, one, it's so funny. I think of actually my travel ball coach who my dad coached with, and he coached third base, um, this travel ball coach. And it's funny. He would always just say the word compete. Like he would like yell it and he would say like five times in a row, he'd just be like, compete compete. And like, all of a sudden, like when our team maybe had, um, you know, one or two errors in a row, Mm -hmm. he would, all he would have to say is just compete. And we're just be like, okay, we're ready for the next play. Like, and and I can't say it always happened that way. Of course we had our moments, but you know, that is a phrase that my dad didn't even tell me that, but, um, it was a younger age that, you know, it did kind of resonate with me, you know, for a long period of time. Um, but, you know, an emphasis on, you know, just, just making it about an external focus was always, you know, something that I've, coaches that I've loved, I've been attracted to, to, to learning that. So, mm-hmm. you know, just focusing on like the pitcher's hip, for example, as a hitter for me really helped me, like you were saying, like lock in and zone in on what I wanted um, you know, getting external and not focusing on like, what is she going to throw me? But like just staring at her hip so I can receive as much data as possible. That really helps me lock in. Um, and that, and that was something that I even told my college coaches. I'm like, just whenever I look kind of weird, just tell me to look at the pitcher's hip because that is something that works for me. Um, so I don't know if I can specifically think of something that my dad said to me. I'm sure if I would hear him say certain words, I'd be like, oh yeah, that. (laughs) <laughs> but, um, all in all, I think that cue as a hitter was definitely a huge one for me. It's just stare at the pitcher's hip because it's going to give you a ton of data. And also you can kind of off to the side, see where her foot's landing and you know, what her what her wrist is doing. So, um, that is a cue that I still give all of my hitters, um, as well, especially when you can tell they're kind of getting distracted and letting other things sink in, but, well, and yeah, like, uh, we had, a. Um a pitcher probably like I want to say it was before Christmas break she was pitching illegally and my head coach was challenging it because she was just coming back and then she would she basically double pump there was no presentation and it's so frustrating out here because some umpires will call it some are like she's not pitching illegally and it's like um okay whatever you know like so that's kind of what we were left with. And my girls were like, coach, coach, what are you going to do? And I was like, nothing. What are you going to do? And they figured it out. Said, yeah. I said, you are going to watch her hip. That's all you are going to watch. 
I was like, don't worry about the double pump. I said, it's just bells and whistles. That's all it is. Mm -hmm. I said, you are going to get whatever's coming at you from the hip. Don't worry about Mm -hmm. anything else. And then after that, the girls just lit her up and they ended up having to pull her. And it was, it was kind of a really cool coaching moment. Like, thank you, Jesus. That all worked out. You know, like, I don't know, but it, it worked out really good, but they all learned from that moment. Like it doesn't matter what the pitcher does, you know, like their presentation, their movement, like their job isn't to see an illegal pitch. Their job is to watch the ball come from the hip. Yeah. It's so easy to get distracted. I mean, prime example of me getting a little too outside myself was the first time I hit against Monica Abbott. So like she's, I mean, talk about lengthy. She's taller than me. She steps outside of the circle to pitch the ball. Like that's how long her stride is. She's Mm -hmm. also lefty. I'm a lefty, like terrifying. And I used to grow up watching her. So of course, all of these external factors played into that first at bat against Monica and, you know, whenever I share it with her now, we just laugh because, you know, I look like a scared puppy in the box, <laughs> but, you know, she threw three pitches right down the middle and I didn't even touch a single one. So that's fun. But as soon as I, you know, got back to that mindset that I was explaining of just, you know, just focus on her hip. Mm-hmm. I know her hip's going to look like it's right next to you, but like, that's where you're going to be able to see the pitch coming from. That's the only way you're going to be able to touch her. And I ended up touching her my next at bat, which was great. I mean, I didn't get out. I was out, but you know, I did, I had my plan and stuck to it, but you know, just the prime example of just, you, you get so outside yourself and you, you, it's, it's easy to do, especially, um, you know, being from the Midwest, we're like, we're, we're only working inside cages and small gyms all winter. And then all of a sudden we're on this big ginormous field and things just get big again we have to have that sort of phrase to help us get very, um, narrow focused Mm -hmm. again. Um, so if you, I mean, if there's any hitting coaches out there, you're a hitter in your training, um, whatever works for you to, to, to create that narrow minded focus, um, in the cage, those same exact thoughts you can take with you. I have hitters who, um, I pitch behind an orange screen. So like the amount of times I say the word orange screen in a lesson is like insane. I'm just like, hit the orange screen. Because if you're going to hit the orange screen, that's relatively up the middle. Your hands are going to stay inside the pitch and you're going to punch it to opposite field. Some hitters have told me that they think of an orange screen when they go play just to narrow their focus even more. And they just feel so much more ready for a situation, especially when things get big. Mm -hmm. So whatever, I mean, whatever it is, orange screen, what, (laughs) like, take it with you if you need it. But, um, yeah, it's, it's really good to get narrow focused. No, I like it. Cause for me as a pitcher, it's all about tunnel vision. Mm-hmm. Like I'm like, Hey, you know, if you say tunnel vision to certain people, they're going to be like, what? That's a bad thing. But when you're a pitcher, uh-uh, we're narrowing everything, control the controllables right here. Mm-hmm. That's all you need to worry about. And I like educating my pitchers that hit too. Like so far I've only coached one PO and that was when I coached at the college level. And that was, that was a learning curve for me because I'd never just had a pitcher. I always was able to feed into that. You're a hitter, take your pitcher brain into the box, you know, apply the same knowledge. And that PO brain is a little different. You know, it's, I don't, I I can't, I haven't found words yet to explain it. It's just very awkward for me. So my girls that do pitch now hit, I have Marley, my daughter. I can't take any credit for her swing. My husband has, he's an amazing hitting coach. He's done a phenomenal job. And then our head coach, um, he's a baseball coach as well. And we're firm believers in softball and baseball swings are not different. Like, you know, you're closer and the bases are closer and that's it. Like one game is longer and one game is shorter kind of thing. Like that's how we tell her and we talk to other girls about it. But, um, Marley has the mentality that if you are a like green coach, she will scare the crap out of you. Like fresh, like an early coach, not a coach that's coming out of college. Like if you see how she gets in a game, you will be like, Oh my gosh, she is in this. She is locked in. But to somebody who's just volunteering and never played at that competitive level, they'll be like, what is wrong with your daughter? Like she won't talk. And I'm like, 
She's locked in. She is locked in. She is not being rude. She's not being disrespectful. She is locked in. And there have been moments as her mom, where I'm talking to her as her coach and she doesn't listen. And it's just funny. There were two times where I've literally had to like grab her face mask and get her eye to eye and say, listen, listen, breathe. And then you just, she comes back. Mm -hmm. I'm like, you need to get a hold of yourself. You know, like <laughs> she's such an old soul, but I do have one athlete in particular that comes to mind. Everything you're telling on this podcast, like I'm going to send this to her mother and like put it in her ears. And I'm also going to continue to repeat, 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 because she has a tendency to allow her moment to get way too big mm -hmm. when it's really just right here. Mm -hmm. It's and the same game. Yeah. I think, uh, what was it? Sierra had posted Rawlings did a video with Sierra the other day and she talked about what she thinks that mentality, that approach as a batter. Mm -hmm. And, um, I sent that to her and I'm just like, this is, you know, this is what you have to think as a pitcher. You think X, Y, and Z as a hitter, you think X, Y, and Z. Yeah. Got to keep yeah. that. So, yeah, I think I just, I just watched something too, along those lines of great hitters. I'm just saying hitters in particular right now, yeah. but like a, a great players in general, mm -hmm. their approach rarely changes, mm -hmm. rarely changes. Um, even depending on the situation, because if we, if we have to have a whole different approach or even routine when, you know, there's two strikes, there's two outs runners at third year down by a run. If we have to like completely change our focus, that means we are, we know that the situation is like different and crazy, but if we know what works for us, whether there's runners on base or not, and we can take that same person into a situation where there is a lot more pressure, but you don't feel it because you're, you're just where you've been before you talked about visualization. Mm -hmm. You've already been there. You feel better in the situation. So great hitters. They really, I, I really can say when I was successful under pressure, it was just, it was just the moment. And I was just focusing on the ball that's coming at me and what, and what I can trust, right? Like it was the same approach for, um, you know, UCLA, my senior year, when I went four for four and knocked a home run over the fence, like my approach there, I, I wanted to make sure that that was my approach for the rest of the season. Like whatever made me successful against mm -hmm. the top 10, I think they were like literally fourth in the nation at the time. Maybe my approach there worked. Why would I change it? If we're going to go play, you know, another team that, you know, maybe isn't in the top 25, you shouldn't, you shouldn't change the approach at all. Right. Um, but yeah, it's interesting that, you know, and it's something that I probably want to just research and dive into more thinking about the brain. And I love sports psychology. I love to, to listen to how great athletes think, um, you really shouldn't have vast different approaches. Right. I don't think depending on whether you're defense, offense, pitcher, catcher, wherever. Yeah, no, I like that. And that, that leads me right in. So your degree allied health and science, or did I say it completely wrong from Purdue? Um, applied exercise and health. That's it. Yes. Yep. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking along the lines of diagnostic medicine because I blurred the lines with, <laughs> sorry. Um, so with that, like, I know that you're probably hypersensitive to like how the body moves and, um, mm -hmm. proprioception training, all these things that build a better athlete, but have you ever considered like going back down that tunnel of education and acquiring any kind of like sports psychology, or are you just going to continue and train the athlete and learn from there and kind of just, you know, create it? That's a great question. Um, yeah. So it's funny. It's really cool that you were able to think of, you know, the kinesiology part and how, you know, I do love, I nerd out about how the body moves. Um, I wanted to be a strength coach originally, um, just because I love weight training. I'm still training, even though I'm seven months pregnant. Um, a lot of people are frowning upon me, uh, but you I don't and care. Pat both are, there's nothing wrong with it. <laughs> like, um, I would like to make this delivery as great as possible. So I'm going to take care of my body anyway. Um, yes, I am a nerd about how the body moves. I think it actually makes me a better hitting coach because I know, you know, when you're at contact, what does your back glute feel like it's doing? If it's tight, that's what it should be doing. Anyway, that was, that was kind of, you know, 
my, my approach to, you know, taking my education and what I learned and bringing it into what I do now. But also it was my senior year, which was the same year. And around the time that I had that great game against UCLA, I was taking a sports psychology class, um, which was required for my major if I wanted to be a strength and conditioning coach. So um, it was that class where I was able to apply the knowledge that I was learning in that class and take it into my games. And I have never gotten over a hundred percent in a class in college before. And this was one where I just out of like, without even trying, I feel like I just thrived in, in this class. And it also happened to be the season that I hit just about 400. So I think that, you know, learning those, those tips from the sports psychology class and a lot of them are things that I've been told to do, but didn't know how to do. Mm-hmm. Um, but learning that has really kind of opened my eyes to so many different things. And I, I now teach the experience that that truly taught me. And no, I don't have a psychology degree. A lot of people ask me if I'm like a therapist. I am not a therapist by yeah, any means. <laughs> um, I, well, I, I don't say that because people will could like, I know, I, it, I, know, I don't know, but I, I feel like our position in athletes' lives, you know, next to their parents, we are the safe place, mm-hmm. you know, we're the and, mentor. Yeah. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah. And, and, and it really helps me kind of know how I could think. And it's funny because I can share so many stories with athletes now about like how this situation or this scenario really shaped who I was as a player. And you're mm-hmm. going through something similar right now. So I, I like where I'm at when it comes down to the things that I've learned. I'm still reading up on a ton of books. I've literally taken courses on psychology. Um, but I, I, I don't know if I'll go and like fully get a degree. Yeah. Who knows? I'm not putting it out of the picture. Um, but I do, I do like to continue to educate myself on the psychology aspect because you and I both know you can have the perfect mechanics but if you don't truly believe in those mechanics, yeah. yeah, If you don't truly believe in them, they're not going to work for you. So, um, yeah, I, I love reading up on books in the, in this aspect, show you this book I've been reading, uh, coaching the mental game. Mm, Who wrote it? H a door. D O R F. Yeah. Dorfman. Great. I'm writing it down. Yep leadership philosophies and strategies for peak performance in sports and everyday life. Mm -hmm. So this is a good book. What I try to do, and it's taken me a minute to get through it, but I try not to do it all in one day. I just do five minutes, five Mm -hmm. minutes of reading. And then I, I, my, I challenge myself when I know like today I'm going to have, I'll have lessons from six to eight. I'll try to apply something there to my sessions. And if not, then, you know, it wasn't it's not time to be applied either mm-hmm. way. I'm going to bank it as something learned kind of thing. Yeah. Um, Since we're sharing books, can I share one with you? Of course. So one of my great friends, I got to take my headphones out real quick. Hang on a second. You're good. I'm like going to write this down. One of my great friends, Amber Selking, um, Dr. Amber Selking, <laughs> um, she worked with Notre Dame football forever Um, and now she works with football teams all over the country and I think even a professional team, but she also works with Notre Dame softball and my affiliation with them is I coached with them in 2019 Mm -hmm. and that was actually my dream school forever, but that's just another, that's so full circle though. Sorry. I I got a, it's, it's kind of a wild, crazy story, but, um, Amber, I met her in person here, literally locally. She lived, she still lives here. Um, she's the one who actually got me into podcasting. So shout out to Amber. Um, but she wrote a book and it came out last year called winning the mental game, the playbook for building championship mindsets. Okay. And, um, she, she throws in a lot of like baseball type scenarios too. There's a, there's some football, but I think just like when it doesn't matter what sport you play, like competitors are competitors and they know how to think and they know how to navigate, um, you know, crazy situations. So, um, this book, I actually had her on my podcast and we talked about like all the chapters of it. Um, but when she says it's a playbook, it's a legit playbook. There is a chapter one is like, let's talk about certain things and then let's take action. And that's what I love about books. It's like when you can actually apply the things that you're learning, like chapter one is awareness. And then chapter two is motivation, confidence. So it's, it's like one of my faves and I know I'll be reading this more than once. What episode do you recall the episode that 
you had spoke with her on? on um, podcast? I'm not good with remembering what numbers they are. Um, but yeah, just look up Dr. Am- Amber Selking on when the cleats come off and you'll be able to see. I'm going to um, definitely put that into the notes. Um, just again, adding value to those athletes. So, yeah. And if we're going to stay on this subject, my sports psychologist in college, Dr. Chris mm-hmm. Carr, he was one of my favorite interviews I've ever done. Um, he blew my mind around the, around the psychology aspect. And we talked about my experience of working with him, um, you know, as a college athlete and actually a professional athlete. So yeah, if these are things that you're interested in, these are all just, I don't mean to plug my podcast all over the place, but I'm the type of person. I know you're the same way. Like if, if I know something can help at least one person, I'm going to say it. So, yeah. I mean, is it helping one person helping all like it's weird. Like eventually it will trickle to everyone. Like eventually mm-hmm. you're told, told, and you're told, and then you hear it. You know what I mean? So mm-hmm. yeah, I love it. Um, big, I'm big time on mental stuff. Um, which brings me to the next thing. Always grind. Got to give a shout out to Joe. Yes. <laughs> um, and a shot gotcha. again, my husband's getting all kinds of shout outs, Mr. Coach B. So our last name is Vander Volk. It's mm-hmm. forever long. So we, everybody just calls him coach B, but, um, I don't know if you remember, but at the conference, he, when I went over to your guys' table at the NFCA conference, Joe was like, you look so familiar. And I was like, I don't know. Like it was really weird. And he was like, is your husband a coach? And I was like, Mm, mm-hmm. yeah <laughs> I was like he's that coach you know what da, da, da. and he was just like oh my gosh you're Daniel's wife and I was like <laughs> yeah he's like I see your pictures on Instagram and he was like I gotta shake your hand I gotta give you a hug he was like your husband was one of the first people to invest in what I do mm-hmm. that's and so cool I, yeah it was weird because I remember just going to my husband's desk and pulling out the always grind notebook and being like, what is this? Oh, this is cool. I want this for my pictures, you know, and knowing that it was, I was putting out there, it was going to happen eventually, but like how everything popped off right there, it was like, sweet. So I ended up getting my order. They were delivered actually the same week that my husband and I were at the American baseball coaches convention. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then we saw Joe again, (laughs) but, um, so shout out to Joe because like, I think our paths, you and I, they would have crossed at some point, but like last year's conference was a game changer for me as far as, you know, your net worth is your network. Mm -hmm. And I met, it was like, I I just remember going to the table and meeting you and looking at you, like I had known you and you should know me. (laughs) It was just like this weird, like, I was like, oh gosh, she, you know, I'm just a fan, you know, but I see my girls, like girls I know, or I have coached before liking you or commenting on your stuff. And I'm like, this is awesome, you know? So just little things, but, um, the journaling concept, another thing that I feel like I was doing before it took off, you know, on the internet or social media on anything. And, I wanted to share with you, like I listened to your breakdown, your four things. Um, I'd have to look in my podcast episode. I can't remember which number it was, but you were talking about, it was four specific things and I cannot remember the words. Um, but for me, I do a brain dump post tourney brain dump post game, Mm -hmm. brain dump, Mm -hmm. the good, the bad personal, the good, the bad team, and then personal goal. What can we do better? What, where can we improve? And then a team goal. So it's actually mm-hmm. six, but usually I find that most of my girls will tie. They just, it's weird. It's very organic how they'll put their personal goal and the team goal will actually go together, which I like because it shows that right away. They're already thinking it's a team effort. So mm-hmm. I really like that. Yeah. Um, but for you, you have um, your notebook. I have the pitcher's notebook. How often do you, like, do you do check-ins with your athletes in the Ashley B training community? Like, how does that work out for you? Yeah. So I'll just say it from like my in-person lessons, because I actually approach the virtual very similarly when we work together. Mm -hmm. Um, But the hitters notebook is what I use, which is the Cajun BP notebook, which now has a really cool calendar in the back. If you want to start tracking your training, 
Um, and it also has like a huge like note section in the back where you can just write down anything and everything. Yep. Um, so, you know, there's, you know, again, some hitters I approach differently with this journal because my super young ones, you kind of have to like tell them what to write so that mm-hmm. they can like look for certain things. Um, but you know, I'll just explain one of my, one of my hitters right now, her name's Kendall. We'll be in the middle of a lesson. She has this journal because everybody has one and she goes, Ashley, like that was like a light bulb moment. Can I write this down? And I'm like, yeah, you can write it down. Like take as long as you need, like go write this thought down. Um, but so for some athletes, like, I don't even have to tell them how to use it anymore. Um, but ideally, you know, I have this system where, you know, my, some of my athletes listening are going to laugh if they don't bring their journal, they have 15 burpees. Like it is a requirement. When you come to the cage, you bring it. And if you don't have a pen or pencil to write with, you have five extra burpees and I'll give you a pen or pencil just so I don't lose my pen or pencils. Um, but <laughs> I, I make it this massive requirement because, you know, unless I do that, they're going to take this journal for granted. And, you know, as someone who was given a journal in college, and this was before I met my sports psychologist, Dr. Carr, I was given a journal and they said, write in it. And I was like, what do you write? You know, Mm -hmm. like I didn't know how to navigate my thoughts until I took the sports psychology class. So, um, I love this journal because it's prompted. So at the beginning there's focus. Okay. So like, what's your focus? If you step into a practice and have a specific focus, um, meaning like they have their big goal, maybe to hit a home run. Well, then our focus of the day might be something along the lines of staying in our legs. That's our focus. If you know, that's your main focus and we write it down now, Throughout the entire lesson, if you start worrying about your hands or what your head's doing, that's not part of our focus. We're not, we don't need to worry about that today. That is not the main plan. So it kind of just keeps them aligned and very intentional with the work that they put in, in my cage. Um, And I just keep reminding them, this is our focus of the day. Stay here. Mm -hmm. Um, And then if whatever our focus is, whatever drills that we do, there's a spot to write down all the drills that we do. And sometimes, you know, we'll come up with like some random drill and I'll be like, what do you want to call this one? (laughs) Because (laughs) as long as you remember what it's called, that's all that matters. So they'll write down the drills that we did with that focus. Um, And it's kind of just like that prompting of like, if they want to go home and continue to work on this, they can just keep redoing this workout. Mm -hmm. It's like a hitting Bible. It's like, okay, I need to get more out of my legs today. This is the workout. This is the page I'm going to open up to and I'm going to go do it. Mm -hmm. Um, Also, if you have some sort of video analysis, which we don't do a ton of in my cage, um, but if we ever do, I have them write down what they see in the video. Um, There's spots to write down like your blast motion or whatever type Mm -hmm. of technology numbers you have. Um, Again, I don't do those every day with my kids or anything, but if they ever want to check in on them, there's a spot to write it. But then the backside's my favorite. Sorry if I'm going too much in this, no. but this is where like, I hope that people, you know, whether you invest in the journal or not, I'll give you a code for it. If you want to just, I, I know I was like, I have one too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Let's use yours. Um, but if, if you have, um, you know, the backside, which is talking about specifically, you know, what did I do well today? And then what, what could I improve? you know, all of, all of Joe's journals, they, they have a very similar theme to them, but as long as you have space, yes, to write down exactly what it is that you did well, you'll start looking for things that you do well. And this is the sports psychology part where I kind of nerd out about, Mm -hmm. but like, unless you look for the good, you're never going to find it. Right. So we are constantly as hitters, as athletes, just in general, we are constantly telling ourselves, I sucked at this. This was so bad. I felt really bad here, blah, 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 which is human nature. So like, if you don't have those thoughts, you're not human. But if those are our only thoughts, you want to know where burnout comes from? You don't know what you did well. You don't know that you're actually great at certain things. So if you start with, and I don't know if Joe designed it this way, but this is how I preach about it. Um, If you start with the things that you did well that day, and then start talking about the things that we can improve. The way you look at yourself is a little different. You kind of sandwich that effect of like, I'm great. And these are the things that I'm great at. Now, these are the things that I'm still going to work on. And then you look at it more as like a challenge, like, okay, this is what I'm going to work on this week is right Mm -hmm. here. Um, But again, if you don't tell yourself what you're good at, you're going to burn out so fast. So, oh yeah. And then, yeah. Sorry. And then just underneath it, it's just the notes part, which is where if you ever have a light bulb moment in a session, 
that's where I'm like, go write it in your notes. Yeah. From start to finish. Right here. Yep. What were you focusing on? Yeah. So yep. it's, it's just like, it's guided journaling, which I think if you're just learning how to, um, analyze your thoughts, this is perfect for you. But again, you don't have to invest in the journal, like to get the benefits of journaling. So right. if you just can af- only can afford a, a notebook like this, like you can, you can have those same exact journal prompts and make sure you write down that stuff. And, and some people have other things they write down too, which, which is unique to them. So yeah. just getting your thoughts down on paper, I can't say it enough. It can truly, you know, help you navigate the really tough days and help you know what went into the really great days as a hitter, as a slapper, as a pitcher, catcher, whatever. Yeah. Well, and I mean, that just goes into life. Like we've been there where, you know, softball's over and yes, we're still coaching, but we have those days where we're like, I just need a day, but you know, you have people depending on you. And sometimes I have to remind myself, you know, have like a CTJ with myself coming to Jesus meeting, like, girl, you're good. Like you've done this, you've done this, you've done that, you know? And I feel like, again, this is the blueprint, you know, softball for life. Like softball is a game of failure. And I feel like life is a game of failure. Like choosing to show up every day is just like getting in the box and choosing to narrow what's going on and make the play, you know, hit Mm -hmm. the ball, run the bases. Like, I don't know wherever you're at on all sides of the ball. That's how I look at life. Mm -hmm. Just, it's crazy. Yeah. So I really like these. My um, my oldest pitcher right now, she is a junior and she plays for Storm 18 U here. She has been probably one of the biggest, like, I don't know, this girl's an old soul when it comes to pitching. Like, I cannot wait to see where she commits. Like, she's talking to a couple of schools right now and I'm just very excited and I can't wait to get the call, you know? when she got this journal, it was like, and I, what I gifted it them for Christmas. And she was like a little kid, like getting candy. She was so excited. And I'm sitting here going like, she's so ahead of a lot of other athletes right now. Like Mm -hmm. whoever ends up getting her in college, they, they're, they're going to be so blessed. Not just because I, I love her to death and she's one of mine, and I know she's good, but she's just, she works at it. She, like you said, you pick out what you're good at. Okay. This is what I'm going to work on this week. Like literally five minutes before her name is Gianna before, um, we text her, you and I started our call. She texted me to let me know that they lost their game to nothing. And I said, what, what pitch wasn't working, what pitch was working kind of scenario. And she broke it down. And I said, what adjustments did you attempt? And she told me the adjustments she attempted and how it wasn't working. And I said, okay, I need you to reset. We have another game at 11. This is how you're going to reset. And it's just like, boom, boom, boom. Like she just, it's like giving her candy. She's like, let's go. She's Mm -hmm. one of the most coachable human beings I've ever coached before. So Mm -hmm. yeah, I like it. Um, with that, with the journaling stuff, um, do you ever have like any competitions between the girls? Like like your older girls that understand healthy competition or do you employ it into the younger girls? Like, yes, you do the burpee thing. Yes. If they forget a pin, you do five more on top of it. Um, is there anything that you like have them do together, not just journal, but like almost create a healthy competition, like who had the most inspiring aha moment? Like, I don't know how to say that. Like, I'm not trying to like make one p- person's experience less than the others, but like just create that culture of healthy competition. Mm-hmm. Um, I will say I don't do a whole lot of journaling competitions and my in-person lessons are just one-on-ones. So it. sometimes it's like me versus you, okay. um, which is not even fair, <laughs> but <laughs> sometimes, sometimes, you know, now that I got a bun in the oven, it's a little more fair, but I will say, you know, from like my virtual lessons that I work with, we have done competitions where I'll say, okay, I'm going to set a timer for 60 seconds. And I want you to think of, or write down, um, all the things that you're great at, like, and just like, what are all the things that you're great at? And then they won't know this, but at the end I'll be like, okay, count how many you wrote down. And the person who wrote down the most wins the challenge. So just simple along the lines of like, 
who is who is actually nicer to themselves like oh yeah you won right so um and those girls that only came up with like two or three of them they're like why how did you get 20 yeah you get 20 by focusing on the good more and so it kind of just like inspires them to just like start looking for the good um from like other challenges i have every time i have a hitter we always end with a challenge um, sometimes it's something as simple of like, if she's popping up a lot or like getting under the ball a lot, um, I'll say, okay, you have to hit five in a row without hitting the top of the, the cage. Um, very mentally challenging, mm. um, very mentally challenging. It might take her, you know, five, 10 rounds and it's a defeating challenge sometimes, you know, for some hitters and, and same thing. I'll give similar challenges, but in different locations for hitters, depending on, you know, what was going on in the lesson. Um, but the idea is if we don't give our, our kids challenges, they're not going to be ready for games because right. games, you have to be able to prepare them for the pressure that they're going to face and have them be able to be like, okay, I don't know how I'm going to do this, but I'm going to figure it out. Yep. Um, and yes, there are times where like, they just aren't getting it. And it's just one of those days where they just won't get it. And we say, okay, we're just going to go, we're going to do this challenge next time. I want you to just think and reflect on like, maybe why it didn't work today and how you're going to approach it differently next time. And, you know, we get back and I'm just like, okay, what's your plan? And they're like, okay, I'm going to do this. And they lock in and they get it done. So I think there's so many different challenges you can give, you know, any sort of athlete from, Mm -hmm. you know, a physical or a mental perspective. But, um, the more I challenge my kids, the more they get excited about, okay, what's the next challenge. I love it. I love it. It's funny how you were like, there's any hitting instructors down there, girl, this is Phoenix, Arizona. (laughs) There is so much going on down here. It is crazy down here as far as like hitting instructors and pitching instructors and infield and outfield. It's nuts. But, um, I, I am drawn to you. Like I said, before I met you, just watching you conversate with girls that I know, it's very genuine. I mean, to the point where I'm like, you know, I might just like sign Mars up, Marley, we call her Mars, just to virtual train with Ash, like just to give her more knowledge. Like, I'm just like, you know, cause I'm not that type of parent coach that only wants my daughter learning one way. You know what I mean? So as much as I can give her, that's what I want to do. And that's how we've approached our boys too. Like the oldest he's playing college ball right now. He's faced some adversity as a freshman. We're like, bro, you made varsity as a freshman in high school. Like, you know, you're at the bottom. Like, this is different. This is the first time, but he was always the, the larger kid, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's been interesting to watch him take what my husband knows and the people that my husband knows and have these people pour into him as well as our middle son, who's a freshman. Um, he, his story is kind of different because he's on the smaller side. So I don't know, like, I, I can't wait, like for your next chapter, just to see as a parent who coaches, your kid is going to just like grow up all around it. Like all three of our kids grew up on the field and I consider ourselves very lucky that all three of our kids fell in love with the same sport that my husband fell in love with and that I fell in love with. Um, I do have friends that coach and their kids play different sports. And I feel like that would be really hard, but at the same time, would it, you know, you just make it adjust. I wanted to ask you, and if you don't want to share this, this is completely fine. But like, do you ever have like those daydreams of, you know, taking the baby in the stroller to a lesson and then you like, you kind of get ahead to where they're three and do you, you sit there and never ponder that stuff? Oh yeah, for sure. Cause you that. know, my work is not like, I don't want to say it's not going to change. It will evolve over time, but you know, I'm going to be given lessons, like I said, till the day that I die and there will be a baby there. And I can't, and uh, honestly, all the moms are excited. They're like, we will watch <laughs> him. We will do all things, but like, yeah, he's going to be exposed to, you know, what I do, what my husband does. And, um, you know, I'm not nervous if he doesn't choose baseball I'm not nervous if he chooses, you know, an instrument over a sport, but I will say 
he's going to be so dang good at whatever he chooses to do though, (laughs) because, um, you know, we're a competitive family and like, if we both come from very competitive families and my husband and I are both very competitive people. So we're, we're excited to create an environment of just like competition, but also just like love. And, Mm -hmm. you know, we've, we've learned so much from our parents. Like I've had my dad on the podcast sharing what, you know, me and my three sisters upbringing was like, um, my husband, he played college golf and even caddied on the PGA tour. So like, we have all of these like fun experiences that we just can't wait to share with him. And, you know, whatever he chooses to do, he's going to be great at it because we're going to practice, but, um, yeah, I can't wait to bring him to lessons. I can't wait to see what, what he ends up doing. Kind of makes me think of like, you know, Patty Gasso and her sons and how yeah. she would, she would bring her kids to the field all the time. And now they're both coaching college softball. Yeah. That's kind of surreal. Crazy. Full, it's crazy. Like, full circle moment right there, which for you no, coaching at Notre Dame. Like that was the mm-hmm. school you wanted to go to. Am I understanding that mm-hmm. right? And then you yep. end up like how, like, let's talk about that. Like, how did that even happen? Starters? <laughs> and, you know, how did you know it was time to move on? To yeah. Evolve? Without, without being too long with this one. Cause it's, I mean, you can I, just want, do- I was a Notre Dame fan from like birth. So my family, okay. We are, we lived in Fort Wayne, which is like two hours from Notre Dame and Notre Dame football. We like lived and breathed it. Um, so from a young age, um, I always looked at Notre Dame as like the place, like where I would love to be. And when I started getting good at sports, um, especially softball, I started going to all their camps and, um, you know, meeting a bunch of the players who have committed there. Um, I even played on a travel team that was one of one of the local teams in Indiana that is very well known, Indiana Magic Gold. Mm-hmm. And one of my teammates was going to play under name. And even when I joined that team, I was like, I could be Jenna's teammate. Like I, I in my head, I'm like, I want to be here. Um, but when I started looking at colleges or even even just like, I guess, wanting to play in college, it was like, well, where do I want to go? Well, obviously I would love to wear an underdame across my chest. Like that would, that would be a pipe dream. Right. Mm-hmm. So my training and, you know, even going to all their camps, I would even hit up there once a week, every once in a while with coaches. So it was like, I tried to do as much as I could to become as great as I could. And when I was in pursuit of Notre Dame, I started getting really good and getting seen by other colleges. And so that's where like other colleges like Michigan state and Purdue and ball state. And like, I don't want to say I had like 20 college after colleges after me. I didn't, I was one of the premier athletes in the state. Um, but you know, Notre Dame recruited me for a minute and it just wasn't in the cards. And honestly it hurt, of course, because like that was the pipe dream, but in pursuit of Notre Dame, I realized like there's this other school called Purdue and I went and visited it and I loved it. And I could not have expected a better college experience for myself ever. So it was in pursuit of Notre Dame. I found my dream school. Um, and then after playing at Purdue, I coached there for a couple of years. And then, you know, a few years later that got the knock on the door, like, Hey, do you, Hey, do you want to coach here at Notre Dame now that you live down the street? And I said, let's do it. And it happened to be the COVID year. So the year where, you know, we started season and then it ended abruptly, mm-hmm. um, But, you know, from a personal aspect, I don't know if I've shared this even on my podcast, but um, during COVID, there was like this blackout period where like no coaches could talk to athletes at all. And my deal was I was doing, um, you know, weekly hitting clinics at Notre Dame. And that's that was how I was still able to work with my youth athletes. Um, But those were cut. I couldn't work with anybody virtually anymore. Like it was like one of those really crazy things where I just made the decision to leave because. I knew how bad it was for the youth athlete during COVID. So I left Notre Dame. I left Notre Dame to um, really dive into the virtual stuff for a while. Um, And then thankfully COVID ended and I got to do my lessons again, but it was kind of one of those band-aids that was hard to rip off, but I'm, I'm glad I did. But also I gained so much knowledge in that almost year of working at Notre Dame. So, well, just going off of your, your episode with Dr. Dot, (laughs) I love her. Mm. She's amazing. Um, how she talked about the team that she ended up playing on the, the red, white, and blue. And she'd had the vision of playing on the Olympic team. 
And then she ended up on this other team be before that. And it ended up being, she didn't realize it till hindsight 2020, right? And she realized red, white, and blue. And then, okay, she's starting to fill the pro prophecy. She starts to see the vision. And just listening to your story, like you had this vision and maybe it wasn't to play, but you still at some point had Notre Dame across your chest. Mm -hmm. Like that's, mm -hmm. that's huge. So in closing, cause I, we've got so much and we could probably make this several pieces, <laughs> but, mm -hmm. um, in closing, I loved your 30 things that you would tell the younger Ashley. And that is usually, um, the last question that I will end with, um, that I want to challenge you because I don't want mm -hmm. you to say the number one. Um, I am going to highlight that episode in my notes as well. Cause you made me laugh on one of them. I was like, Oh my gosh, like this, I think it was like number seven or number 15. I can't remember. But... Oh gosh. I got to go back to my notes to know which one that was. <laughs> I was like, Oh, shit. you know what? I it was probably that. like, get the sleep. It was probably just I like, I think it was that one. Like stop studying till 1am. Like it's not helping anyone. Just go to sleep. <laughs> it was actually number eight. No. Yeah. I think it was number, what was number eight? It may have been number eight, seven or eight. Um, the way you learn is different. Okay. That I, one I, I was just... nodding my head. I think it was the sleep because I did not. Oh, smoke. number six was like quit overthinking what to wear. <laughs> oh yes. Yes. It was that one because I have now, like, I don't know about you, but like if something fits, I will get it in like four different colors or maybe I'll get four different of the same color. Yeah. You know what you like. Yeah. That's <laughs> yeah. the way to do it. I, I really did. I struggled, you know, with trying, I was a people pleaser. I still am at times, but like when I was younger, I just wanted to fit in. Right. Mm -hmm. So like I would take an hour just to choose an outfit and like, what good does that do anyone? Like right. absolutely nothing. And then when I end up choosing, I'm just like, well, I don't like it, <laughs> you know, like <laughs> just so dramatic, but I will say like, you will save so much time first of all, but also who gives an, a rat's butt what you wear? Like just wear something that just wear it, just wear something. And like, obviously I tell, you know, tryouts are coming up soon. And I tell all my athletes, like wear your favorite outfit, like your favorite pants, your favorite hairstyle, like wear your favorite thing. Cause look good, feel good, play good as a thing. Mm -hmm. But like, like you said, like stack your closet with things that you like and get out of the stuff that you don't like anymore. Like quit worrying about it. Oh, it yeah. took me forever when I did bodybuilding to get rid of my shred, like two weeks before competition clothes. Now my daughter wears them. Like, like I've <laughs> hung on to some of them and she's like, mom, can I wear this? I'm like, yeah, you can just have it. Cause I'm just going to be in bulk mode the rest of my life. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so I like lifting. I, I get that. But um, mm -hmm. so with that being said, uh, and I, I wanna be like, I wanna I want you to tell at like the young Ashley athlete. Mm -hmm. Because we are very softball athlete focused on this particular podcast. Like, what would you tell her, you know, if you could go back and have a conversation like you have with your athletes right now? Um so I'm actually like cheating off my list, but the <laughs> one, one that I chose and that I really, really wish I would have heard sooner was understanding the fact that like the way I learn things is different than the way other people learn things. Like I am a visual learner. So like, if you show me what to do, kind of like drumline, you show me mm -hmm. the thing, mm -hmm. I'm going to go repeat it and try to do it as best as I can and get as good as I can with it. I used to, and this, this is actually academics too. Like I realized that, you know, I was a little further behind than other people because it took me so much longer to absorb things. But if I would have been able to accept the fact that it takes me longer to learn something mm -hmm. and to get good at something, I could have breathed a little bit easier because I was the athlete who in high school, yes, I made varsity as a freshman, which is great and exciting. And a lot of people dream of doing something like that. I was good, but I wasn't great. But over those four years, it was my job to just keep getting a little bit better, keep getting a little bit better. And when I focused on myself, getting just a little bit better at a time, like that's where I found my college scholarship. And same thing with college. Like I only had like four or five schools looking at me. I wasn't a top recruit in the country, but I went to go play professional softball because I took that same approach into my 
my high or my college years too. It's like, okay, I'm not the best outfielder here, but I can be the best version of me here. And when I would lean into, you know, you learn differently, Ash, like how your right fielder is learning this thing. She's getting it right away and you're not, and that's okay. Like just stick with it. Um, I used to beat myself up so much at a young age because I, I took forever to learn things. Um, and along with that, it's just like kind of trust in your gut too. Cause I think half the time I would overanalyze everything when I should have just trusted my gut from the start. I love it. So if you're an athlete and you're listening to this, trust your gut, the words mm-hmm. from Ashley B training and that like literally use it on the field and use it off the field and take it with you throughout your entire life. Mm-hmm. Like that is, that is going to save your life in moments when you're not playing softball anymore. You know, that's huge. All right, mm-hmm. girl. Well, I appreciate everything leading up to this like preparation and then you just being here with me and hanging out. Um, I look forward to cultivating like more stuff with you and I can't, are you, you're going to the conference this year, right? I should be. I plan yeah. to. Yeah. I was it's closer say, to me too. Well, and you might have a uh, plus one, like if you bring little guy on the way. <laughs> oh, he's not coming. There's no way. <laughs> no, that's cool. I'm like, that kid would be so like, here, we're going to expose you to everything. <laughs> yeah. Not yet. Not yet. I'm mm-hmm. your immune system now. <laughs> Just no, mommy's going to have her own time with her friends. I, I love it. We should do a podcast. <laughs> Once that baby's born, we're going to talk about mommy time. <laughs> Deal. All right. I got well, a lot to learn. Yes. You, you're going to, you're going to be great at it. And, um, been thinking a lot about you, like with that and how you go through that. And the fact that you've been working out throughout the whole pregnancy, it's going to make the, after you, your bounce back is going to be a lot better mentally, so. emotionally, and physically. So I hope so. I do feel very confident when I lift heavy things. So as do I. those things just might be entire play sets now. <laughs> I love it. You know? Or a crib. There you go, girl. Okay. Well, I'm going to get off here. So I really appreciate your time. I appreciate you. Thanks for having me on. Thank you, hon.